Incorporated in 1837, the city of Chicago had a booming economy and experienced massive growth in the run-up to the turn of the 20th century. In 1840, Chicago was the 92nd most populous city in the United States. By 1870, it was the second most populous city in the United States, and by 1900, it was the fifth most populous city in the world, behind only London, New York, Paris, and Berlin. Between 1890 and 1900, the population of Chicago doubled, and between 1900 and 1920, it doubled again. An industrial center had attracted not just mass immigration from Europe, but also from African Americans from the Deep South and what was called the Great Migration. The population of African Americans in Chicago in 1910 was around 44,000. By 1930, that population was around 234,000. And that spurred an explosion in African American art and literature and music that was called the Chicago Black Renaissance but also drove racial tensions that resulted in the terrible 1919 Chicago race riots in which 38 people were killed. And then the passage of the 18th Amendment in 1919 brought the nation into the era of prohibition and Chicago became notorious worldwide as a center of gangland violence as rival gangs competed over the control of liquor imported from Canada in the bootlegging wars and the gangster era. The murder rate in Chicago increased 250% between 1923 and 1928, and it is therefore not surprising in this huge, growing, sprawling city that was roiling with tensions at the sort of typical conflict that cab drivers might have over places to pick up fares was taken to unbelievable heights. The Chicago taxicab wars of the 1920s deserve to be remembered. John Daniel Hertz was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1879, and his family immigrated to Chicago when he was five years old. He was a successful prize fighter in his youth, and then managed prize fighters, but by 1904 he was selling cars, a job at which he excelled. In 1907 he became part owner of an automobile dealership with a friend named Walden Shaw when he struck upon a business idea. The dealership was making good sales, but much of their resources were tied up in the cars traded in. The used car market had not developed yet, and these represented a financial liability. He was later quoted as saying, As my customers weren't buyers of second-hand cars, I had to put on my thinking cap to find some ways of disposing them or making them earn their keep. His idea was to use the surplus to get into the relatively new business of renting pay-as-you-go taxi cabs. At the time, horse-drawn handsome cabs were still the norm, and there were few motor car taxi cabs operating in Chicago. But Chicago, where numerous railroads had terminals, was a prime location for taxicabs, as there was considerable need for on-demand, point-to-point, chauffeur-driven transportation. Hertz's brainchild, the Walden W. Shaw Auto Livery Company, quickly developed into one of the top motor cab companies operating in Chicago. In 1910, rates were 30 cents for the first half mile, and 10 cents for each quarter mile thereafter. The company was innovative in a number of ways. For example, paying drivers by commission rather than salary, and in 1912, hiring women drivers, as that was supposed to address problems associated with men driving cabs, including impertinence to customers, overcharging for their own benefit, recklessness and fast driving, and inattention to the company's business. And those were just some of Hertz's innovations. Another one, for example, was that he, at his own expense, installed traffic lights on Michigan Avenue between Randolph and 12th Street. The resulting improvement in the flow of traffic was so impressive that the city of Chicago decided to expand the system and to reimburse Hertz. But Hertz's real innovations came in 1913, after visiting Paris and learning about their successful taxicab service there. Parisian cabs were solid black, making them easy to recognize. Unlike the large touring cars that they were using in Chicago, they were small, purpose-built vehicles, allowing lower upfront costs and lower operating expense. And Parisian cab drivers were more polite than those in America, spurring Hertz to limit his hiring only to the finest grade drivers, who would be trained in courtesy and rewarded with higher wages, more respect from the company, and, unusual for the day, company-paid health care. The company started using purpose-built cabs, built around a four-cylinder Continental engine, all painted yellow. Hertz claimed the color was based on a university study that he commissioned that determined that yellow was the easiest color to spot, although there had been handsome cabs painted yellow in other cities at least since 1798. The color not only made it easier for customers to identify taxis, but the visibility of the color reduced accidents. The company was reorganized as the Yellow Cab Company. Notably, the Yellow Cab Company operated on the European model. Previously, livery cabs had operated under contracts with clubs and businesses, paying a fee to those businesses. The Yellow Cab Company instead would pick people up on the street, foregoing those fees. The new model allowed them to offer better service for a lower price. 
the Yellow Cab Company found great success, not just dominating the Chicago taxicab market, but also selling their purpose-built cabs and licensing franchises in other cities. Unexpectedly, Hertz's innovation had set the stage for the Chicago Taxi Wars. Hertz was a hard businessman and was noted for using heavy-handed tactics to put pressure on competitors to go out of business or to sell out to him. By 1920, the Yellow Cab Company had a virtual monopoly in the city of Chicago. The Yellow Cab's biggest competition were the lime green and cream-colored taxis of the Checker Cab Company. Unlike Yellow Cab, the Checker Company was an association of independent cab owner and operators who used a single livery. Competition for fares was always rough and tumble, with cab drivers pushing hubcap to hubcap at prime locations. But Hertz had pulled political strings to get the city to pass a cab stand permit law, a deliberate attempt to shut out checker drivers. Reportedly, yellow cab drivers got permits quickly, but checker cab drivers always faced delays. Checker complained, and when a councilman investigated, bad words were exchanged between the two companies. Many of the checker drivers had been former yellow cab drivers, and Hertz considered them bad seeds. Yellow Cab's lawyer called the checker drivers an irresponsible bunch of hoodlums. But the bad blood between the two companies turned violent on July 27, 1920. It started when a fistfight erupted between cabbies of the two companies jockeying for position on a prime spot in front of a theater on The Loop, the central downtown business district. By evening, the fight had turned into a running gun battle that the Associated Press described as a battle between fleets of taxi cabs in which the vehicles were maneuvered according to the best strategy of tank warfare, with their drivers firing hundreds of shots at each other. At one location, a dozen cabs in close formation roared by the branch garage of the other company with pistols of the occupants crackling like machine guns. The garage defenders replied with several volleys and sent a fleet of cabs in pursuit. Amazingly, there were no casualties. The goal seems to have been property damage and intimidation. But soon casualties started occurring. A driver was wounded in the foot by gunfire on August 5th, and two more on August 7th. By the end of August 1920, ten employees from the two companies had been wounded in gun battles that erupted nearly every night. At one point, city council minutes referred to the situation as a war of terrorism on the streets of Chicago. In response, police stepped up their presence, and the taxicab ward simmered down. But it escalated again in June of the next year. On June 7, 1921, a car drove by a loop taxi stand and men inside fired 25 shots. One struck a yellow cab driver named P.A. Skirvin above the heart, killing him. John Hertz told the Chicago Tribune, It has only been comic opera warfare until tonight, but from now on it is going to be a fight to the finish. The murder of Skirvin had been the culmination of a violent day. A passenger in a checker cab was injured on June 9th when yellow cabs forced it into the curb. Fights erupted throughout the day. A checker cab rammed a yellow cab, starting a brawl in which several drivers were injured. A group of yellow cab drivers overturned a checker cab, starting a gunfight in which a driver was wounded. Later that evening, another driver was wounded when he was hit in the head with a brick. The murder of Skirvin, who was shooting the breeze with other drivers, was found to be in retaliation for the driver hit with a brick. The shooting itself was perpetrated by three mob enforcers, but the drivers of the cab carrying them were identified and, in 1925, were convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Their family still insists that they were fall guys for the mob, and their sentences were commuted by Illinois Governor Len Small in 1928. Again, the city council intervened, having the police search all cabs for weapons and threatening to pull both companies' operating licenses. But violence erupted again in 1923, as men in a checker cab fired shots at a yellow cab superintendent, and then fired at the police pursuing them. In the midst of it all were charges of political and police favoritism, corruption, and mob involvement. In 1924, the cab war started a new phase, as a violent union dispute started within the checker cab company. At first, checker cab was a non-union operation, and then as drivers started to unionize, the organization broke down into violence. Mobsters were trying to control the unions and joined in the fray. At one point, in an act of intimidation, four masked men assaulted a checker cab headquarters and put a group of non-union drivers against a wall, threatening to kill them. A police protective detail that was supposed to be protecting the building and those within it had been mysteriously pulled away moments before the attack. The next morning, the men made good on their threats as a drive-by shooting killed one of the non-union drivers. The fight between Checker Cab and Yellow Cab erupted again in 1928, when an argument over a loop location turned into a general brawl and a Checker driver named Eugene Thibridge was shot dead. A Yellow Cab driver was arrested. Within a week, bombs exploded at two Yellow Cab car garages, destroying 17 cabs. 
police theorized that the bombings were revenge for the shooting of Thiveridge. Then the war turned directly against John Hertz. He bred racehorses, and in October 1928, a fire burned down his stable, killing 11 racehorses worth an estimated $200,000. A prosecutor was assigned to investigate Checker, and a grand jury was impaneled over the incident. Then Hertz received death threats and was told that his grandchildren would be kidnapped. A few days later, another bomb was found at a yellow cab facility before it could detonate. Apparently getting the message, in 1929, Hertz sold his stock in yellow cab and left the business. Ironically, yellow cab's fleet merged with Checker. Eventually, the city council was able to tamp down the taxi wars by limiting the number of medallions, or permits, to legally operate a taxi cab, and thus reducing competition. There were still some violent incidents over union contracts, but today the IRS considers taxi cab drivers to be independent contractors, and that is put an end to most union disputes. Things like rates and pay are usually regulated by the cities, and the last major taxi cab driver strike in Chicago was back in 1980. In many ways, the taxi cab wars of the 1920s represented the stresses that were uh, uh, in Chicago and the nation generally at the time. Things like modernization, massive demographic changes, the economic dislocation of the recession that followed the First World War, and of course the coming Great Depression, the violence of the Prohibition era, rampant corruption among city officials and police departments put the taxi cab drivers, which is a, a natural point of job entry for new immigrants, on the front lines of social conflict. John Hertz did not stay retired for very long. In 1924, he had acquired a different business, which he had sold to General Motors. But in 1953, he purchased that business back from General Motors. It was, of course, a competitor for taxi cabs, drive your own rental cars. And that company, Hertz Rent-A-Car, still bears his name and appropriately still uses the color yellow in all its marketing. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.